This episode explores the healing power of community. Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds, where we explore the intersection between art and well-being. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. How does art lead to change? I ask myself this question a lot, and it's the main reason that I interview artists for this show. This episode is about a film that turns everything I thought I knew about art leading to change on its head. This is a film about the most beautiful mural you'll never see. It's the story of how the destruction of a piece of public art led to change. In the documentary film Alice Street by Spencer Wilkinson, we watch as two artists from Community Rejuvenation Project plan and paint a mural on Alice Street in downtown Oakland. It took years to get the permission to put this mural on the walls of a parking structure. The two artists designing the mural, who are named Desimundo and Pancho Pescador, really wanted the surrounding community to feel seen and represented. The space for the mural has great historical significance in Oakland. The nearby Malanga Cascalord Center for the Arts houses dance, music, and performance groups of the African diasporic community, and the Hotel Oakland houses many seniors from the Chinese diasporic community and is the gateway to Oakland Chinatown. After months of interviews and negotiations with the folks in these two centers, Desi and Pancho come up with a design that reflects the community's wishes. When the Alice Street mural was finally completed, the community celebrated. There was a day with food and music and performances from people from both of these centers and the surrounding neighborhood. Just a few short weeks later, the owners of the parking lot adjacent to the wall with the mural decided to develop it into a luxury high rise. The new building would cover up the freshly completed mural. So, was this the end, or was it only the beginning? Spencer Wilkinson is the director of One Voice, the story of the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir, Oakland Boogaloo, an episode of KQED's If Cities Could Dance series, and the documentary we'll be talking about today, Alice Street. You might think of this film as part of a ripple effect of the Alice Street mural and the coalitions formed in response to the mural being covered by luxury development. I don't think the word ripple really does the film justice, though. For many, watching this film will be the only opportunity to see this mural. But Spencer doesn't let the story end on this moment of defeat because the surrounding communities didn't let the story end in defeat. The gripping story told in this film shows the precarious nature of public art and the precarious position of long-term communities in the face of development in Oakland. It also shows the power of creating coalitions across diverse communities. If art is a way to preserve your cultural heritage, what is the next step if that art is essentially erased? I think of Alice Street as an action-adventure film about a mural because the twists and turns in the plot are an emotional roller coaster. I really appreciate Spencer's ability to tell this multi-layered story and go beyond what feels like a tragic ending to show the real impact of this mural in awakening the power of coalitions. Before we meet today's guest, I want to tell you about an app called Newsly. Newsly is an all-in-one audio super app for iOS and Android. There really hasn't been an app like Newsly before now. 
Newsly picks up all of the trending articles on the web and reads them to you in a natural human voice. You can find any topic you're interested in, sports, politics, or art. I've loved using this app. I listen to it when I'm commuting or when I'm gardening or while I'm cooking, anytime where I want to catch a little bit of news, but my hands are full or I can't stop to read. You can also find trending podcasts from over 50 countries on Newsly, including Art Heals All Wounds. Newsly has become my go-to listening app for podcasts. If you want to try Newsly yourself, just download it from www.newsly.me. And if you use the promo code ARTHEALS, you'll get a free one-month premium subscription. I'll include all of this info in the show notes so that you can just click on the link and use the Art Heals promo to get your free trial. Now, let's meet this week's guest. Hi, Spencer. Thank you so much for being on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start by introducing yourself by telling us who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Spencer Wilkinson. I'm a documentary filmmaker based here in Oakland, California, and uh, recently finished my second feature film called Alice Street. Yeah, and I wanted you on the podcast because your film, Alice Street, really just blew me away. One of the most moving, heartbreaking and motivational films I saw of this past year. And it's so multi-layered. It's a great film about creating a piece of art, how to incorporate the community's input into a public piece of art, how to create coalitions, how to gain some political momentum with these coalitions, and then also the heartbreak of letting go of a beautiful creation. And any one of those things would have been an amazing film. And when I watched your film, I just kept thinking, oh my God, like each new development, I just was amazed. So can you tell us a little bit about the story of Alice Street? Well, again, thank you for those words about the film. I'm so glad that uh, it touched you, mm. as well as, like you said, these how-tos that came out of it. You know, mm. that's what I'm really excited about is how it can help spread some of that information mm -hmm. to communities that might uh, benefit from it. But in regards to the story, the film takes place on one intersection in downtown Oakland. And it really uh, starts with two muralists who uh, begin one of their largest projects to date in a very significant neighborhood in downtown Oakland, which, you know, Oakland is... I, for a long time, has been the third most diverse, or sometimes the first most diverse city in the country. Right. So the muralist chose to really depict two of the communities that really uh, reside at that intersection in downtown Oakland by focusing on community centers that were mm -hmm. literally on the intersection. Mm -hmm. um, so they they kind of through the process of coming up with their design for the mural get to know the community with, again, this focus on the African diasporic arts and culture community in downtown Oakland, along with the kind of Chinese diasporic community that reside in a very important old hotel, kind of historic hotel called Hotel Oakland, right. um, which also in a way is a gateway to Oakland Chinatown. So those two histories of these two, you know, very distinct communities that have a lot of kind of connections between them are pictured on the walls uh, by the two primary artists. Again, the two artists that are, are featured in the film are Desi Mundo and Pancho Pescador, mm -hmm. uh, who were part of an organization called uh, Community Rejuvenation Project. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, took on this large project. And in the midst of the, the making of it, we get a sense for the large scale changes that are occurring in downtown Oakland due to forces of gentrification. Right. So the mural in a sense almost becomes a symbol of what's going on around in that neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. which takes a turn, the story takes a turn in the film. And I, I'll stop there, you know, I could go deeper into all the details of the inner workings of the story, but that's the, the setup. Right, well, you're being modest. The story takes a couple of turns. It does sort of feel like I don't want to. I don't want to misrepresent it, but it feels like one of those action adventure 
films where you think, oh, okay, shoo, they made it. And then the next big challenge comes up. So I want to go back to what you said, because one of my favorite parts about this film was seeing how these two artists, what are the Desi and, and Pancho, worked with the community to create the design of their mural. That was such an inspiring and instructive thing to see about how to do public art the right way. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that process and also sort of maybe some of the coalitions that came about or maybe some of the intersections that came about between two different communities as a result of this public art project. Yeah, well, CRP, Community Rejuvenation Projects, their kind of, I think their process that preceded this this story was really to work with the local community Mm. to determine what should go on the walls in that neighborhood. Right. A lot of artists, you know, who are muralists just kind of come into a neighborhood and they have their sketch or their idea in mind already. Mm -hmm. And they're just kind of putting their work up. In this case, it's a different process. It's a lengthy, complex uh, series of steps that lead to the eventual kind of decision around a a design Mm -hmm. that will go up on the wall. And so in this case, Desi and Pancho not only consulted directly with the community, but they also did a lot of background research, historical research. They worked with uh, Eric Arnold, a longtime journalist in Oakland, to understand the history that went into creating these two very important centers, Mm -hmm. along with kind of the, the larger communities that those centers serve. And yeah, in the film, you know, you see Desi and Pancho bringing their sketch into those centers, you know, and having meetings with the local community to say, hey, does this, is this working? Does this reflect your story? And sometimes they got pushback. In some cases, those communities said, actually, no, this isn't quite right. Some of these images work and others don't. Yeah. And I love that part because it was so much about how an artist can listen and really see that even with the best of intentions, that they're not representing people the way that they think of themselves. I especially loved um, the Chinese American participants from Hotel Oakland who did not like that the majority of images were going to be about the discrimination against Chinese Americans and against the struggles, because they had a whole history that was about pride, that was about accomplishment. And they really felt misrepresented by that. And, you know, that that was the that was the great intentions, but it was fantastic to see how these two artists were willing to really say, oh wow, that's okay, we'll go back to the drawing board. Right. And that that kind of thing, right? Having the opportunity to hear from the community when you don't have it right before it goes up on the wall and potentially does damage, you know. That's right. Um, I think it's that extra step that does take a lot of effort, but it allows this information to come to light. And, you know, I think the two artists, they're coming from their own perspective, right? Their own lived Mm -hmm. experience. And in some respects, both of them are pretty politically, you know, I would say more on the radical end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the depiction they were choosing to go with was really about this kind of the, the strife and the resistance and the oppression that the Pan-Asian community experienced Mm. uh, throughout the history of Oakland. Right. And yeah, they really heard back from the community that they they wanted to see some, you know, celebration. You know, they wanted to, the people who lived literally across the street, whose windows faced this wall, who would be seeing these images day in and day out, wanted to see something that would uplift them, that would inspire them. And it really caused the artists to go back to the drawing board. Right, right. I I can't remember. Did you mention the name of the other cultural center? Is it the Malanga Cascalord? It is, yeah. The Art Center? Mo- yeah, Malanga you, Cascalord Center for the Arts. Can you talk a little bit about some of the organizations that are housed in this center? 
Definitely. And, um, you know, the Malanga Cascalor Center for the Arts was originally actually a, a building that housed kind of a political organization for women in Oakland. It was an mm. empowerment center for a, like a women's club. Mm. It started as a women's club in like the 1920s. Oh, wow. I didn't and know And so that. it went, th- yeah, it went through a few different kind of um, roles. Well, for a while it was a hotel, you know, low income hotel. And then in the, I believe in the 80s, a group of diverse dance companies and arts companies identified that to become an important center for the arts in Oakland. And it took a lot of lobbying and Mm -hmm. organizing on their behalf to get access. At the time, uh, spacing on his his name right now, the the mayor, uh, Lionel, I think it's uh, Lionel Wilson. Yes. Isn't it what Lionel Wilson? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, They got his support in order to get access to the building. Initially, there were kind of the anchor tenants were Dimension Dance Theater, Mm -hmm. Diamanakura, West African Dance Company. There was the Oakland Ballet. Wow. And there was the Oakland Ensemble Theater, who all kind of moved in together. I believe I got that right. There have now, you know, it's now uh, become a home for 20 different very important dance companies, theater companies, uh, music companies. But there really has this focus on the African diasporic arts. And it's one of the largest centers of its kind in the country, perhaps in the world. And it's kind of this little known, for some reason, it really just hasn't gotten its spotlight in Oakland for the contribution it makes to the African diasporic arts scene nationally. Um, But it's a really important space. And, you know, there's other groups I I would, you know, be remiss to leave out Axis Dance, you know, which is a very important company that focus on abled and disabled artists, dancers, uh, world-class, Fua di Congo, which is the namesake of the center, Malanga Cascagol, or his kind of legacy, his children continue on that, that tradition. And so many others. There's Lika, which is really a Filipino heritage dance company as well, and so many others. Uh, it's, it's really a, a kind of a powerhouse center right. in downtown Oakland. Right, right. Well, that's the thing I forgot to mention, too, is that I've lived in the area for over 30 years, and I pass by the Hotel Oakland all the time. And I always think, huh, I wonder what that is. And my daughter has taken dance lessons at the Malanga Cascal Arts Center with Axis Dance Company, and I had no idea of its history. So that was another thing that I thought, wow, every person who has any interest in Oakland should watch this film just for the history that's being shown. But I want to go into the story a little bit of how you came about making this film. How did you happen to start filming? Just tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, you know, it's funny. I was living right in the neighborhood. I was actually living on Alice Street, a couple blocks from the mural site. And I knew Desi previously, just kind of through the community. In my kind of like previous to filmmaking, I was doing a lot of more community-based work. Mm -hmm. I was working with uh, young people as a social worker as a job trainer in San Francisco and Bay Area and Oakland. So through that work, I got to know Desi a little bit Mm -hmm. and we're just kind of like peripherally connected. And, you know, I think he found out I was doing more of the kind of video documenting work and approached me, letting me know that they were going to be starting this big mural project. And as part of the history, they were hoping to conduct interviews Mm -hmm. in the neighborhood to understand what they needed to depict on the walls right so it really started off as just kind of this oh yeah i can help you out with uh conducting a couple interviews for me it was really interesting because i'd taken a couple dance classes at the malunga center i had a real interest in learning more about that space i wanted to know more about you know the oakland chinatown history Mm -hmm. so it was kind of a chance for me to get to know the community through conducting these interviews And then kind of in the process, you know, I was watching Oakland, downtown Oakland, go through these big radical changes due to gentrification and luxury condominiums being built where there were kind of mom and pop shops and Mm -hmm. 
these large scale shifts happening in the cultural fabric of downtown Oakland were mm -hmm. happening right around me, this kind of became an opportunity for me to document what was occurring, what was the pushback within the community. And, you know, so the, the mural just kind of became like an avenue for, for me to gain access in that way. And that's kind of how we started. And then it became something, something else. Yes. So I think we have to get into a little bit more of the plot because, again, if someone asked me to name some of the best films about Oakland, yours would probably be at the very top. And then if someone asked me to name some of the best films about gentrification, yours would also be at the top because you do show that, yes, gentrification, it's an economic story. It's a cultural story. It's a change in population. But I think I've rarely seen all these different elements come together so well in a film. And particularly what I want to focus on is the loss of culture that happens with gentrification. And somewhere, well, maybe we'll tell the first big setback. So somewhere towards the end of creating this mural, I think it's towards the end, you find out about the first setback. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Sure. Well, and thank you again for, for what you just said about the film. It's mm. kind of humbling to hear that. And, mm. um, you know, it's really uh, true. Well, thank you. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it can be impactful on a variety of levels. Um, but in regards to, yeah, the story and the setbacks, there were kind of setbacks from the outset. Mm. You know, it was a big challenge for these guys to figure out the material that would go on the walls negotiate with the property owners to get access to those walls. Mm -hmm. And even from the beginning, there was resistance from those property owners to even mm -hmm. grant permission to the muralists to paint mm -hmm. because of this big changes going on in downtown. Right. And one property owner in particular had the plan from the outset to create the largest skyscraper in downtown Oakland <laughs> out of what is like this, basically like a brick parking lot right. across the street from the Malanga Cascalord Center, a two-story brick parking lot. You know, he has these massive plans. He's, you know, he says in the film, you know, I'm, I want to put Oakland on the map with this 37-story skyscraper. Right, you know, because Oakland's all, not on the map yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and from a developer's point of view, that's how Oakley gets on the map, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, even from the outset, they're having to go through these lengthy negotiations in order to even get permission to start the painting. It literally mm -hmm. took over two years mm -hmm. wow. from the idea of painting a mural to getting to actually begin to paint. Yeah, wow. And part of that is also, you know, they're fundraising and getting getting everything together. But the negotiation was a big setback in terms of time and, and, and just hassle. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they're, they feel like they've gotten the permissions all worked out. They're moving forward with the mural. They, they get a chance to paint this thing, which takes, again, about, you know, six months over a year uh, because they have to go in phases and have a big celebration. Yeah. And literally, like, within weeks of the celebration they find out there's a new development plans that would go into the actual parking lot and obscure all four walls with the luxury condominium yeah. and that's kind of where the story really takes a twist is the um what do you do yeah. you just worked two years negotiations countless hours actually painting deliberating on on the design and it's going to be covered within months and you know, then then the community and the and the muralists really had to decide what what to do to respond to that. Yeah, and that's the part where, as a viewer, you're sort of feeling this sense of vicarious victory because you jumped through all of these hoops to get this mural made. There is this enormous celebration of communities coming together who might not necessarily come together, performances from the different people in these different centers. And all of a sudden, you hear this announcement about this new development. And that's the part where really your heart is just like, like squeezed. And I'm wondering how you 
as a filmmaker felt when you got that news about this new development? I mean, I think because I'd spent so much time with the artists Mm -hmm. and with the community and, you know, being at that celebration, so many of the people depicted on the wall were there. So many groups from the Malanga Center came out to perform, to celebrate this kind Mm -hmm. of their heritage finally being kind of acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So the idea that it would be covered and in a sense erased this history mm-hmm. erased from the public view mm-hmm. i mean it became like the mural became this gathering place you know tour buses would stop there and local classrooms from oakland unified school district would, would visit would get mm-hmm. you know mural tours mm-hmm. it really became this kind of important community space Right. And for it to be, you know, covered up so quickly and, you know, ironically through this kind of luxury condominium, the the face of the changing Oakland, you know, I felt it on a variety of levels. And again, I was at this point still living on Alice. So Mm -hmm. I would walk by the mural daily almost, you know. Um, So it was was kind of like this tragedy. And I think it was palpable within the neighborhood that, you know, they were going to lose this thing that had taken so much effort and so much time and and really reflected that the beauty of the community. So it was a hard moment. Yeah, I can imagine because it's hard enough just to watch it in the film. And the beautiful thing that happens is that you don't just let the film be a tragedy. You do talk about the results of the creation of some of these coalitions in terms of whatever gains they were able to get from this developer and probably other developments can now follow suit. So for me personally, it doesn't quite soothe me in terms of the mural being covered up. But what I appreciated about your film is that you don't just let it be a story of defeat. Well, I think the the community didn't let it be that. The neighborhood didn't allow it. Many of the artists at the Malanga Classical Arts Center who started those important dance companies were also, by necessity, activists just to kind of assert their space in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And when they found out that this condominium was being planned, they decided to resist it. And that looked like in a variety of different ways. It started out with trying to contact the planning department putting together a protest, you know, bringing together these different communities, diverse communities that reside around that intersection, going, you know, marching to City Hall, marching Mm -hmm. into the planning department, playing the drums, dancing. Mm -hmm. And there's also, you know, political forces that are at play here because with a new development being planned, it has to go through steps within the city it has mm-hmm. to go through the the planning department. It has to go through the, I think, yeah, it is, the, I guess, the, the planning commission. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's there's meetings that have to take place. There's community meetings that take place. where And some of those community meetings actually took place inside the Hotel Oakland. And in all of these different places that these meetings took place, the community showed up and voiced mm-hmm. their concerns Mm-hmm. about this this condominium and not only that it would obscure the mural mm-hmm. because you know for people who live there the mural is great of course but we're also talking about parking spaces that the Malanga Cascal Lord Center relies on for the students right. that come in and and take classes or attend performances there've already been a lot of issues with new people moving into the neighborhood and complaining about the drumming coming from the Malanga Center and, and, you know, putting complaints to the city. So the community members showed up at all of these different meetings and voiced their concern, set up a protest. And even then, you know, the planning commission just kind of greenlighted the project, Mm -hmm. which forced them to, like you said, uh, form a coalition and directly negotiate with developers around community benefit agreements, which you know, I can talk about, but it was inspiring. Yeah. It was super inspiring to see people just kind of rally and do the difficult work to kind of push back on, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars represented by a new development, you know, it's, and to watch kind of the, the process of how it 
how difficult it is to push back. Yeah, and your film does a great job of showing that as well, that, you know, when there are certain economic forces at play in a city, it doesn't really matter how many people within the city might be objecting. Often that their voices will just get pushed aside and these a lot of these projects get steamrolled into an area. But there were some specific gains that they made in negotiating with the developer. Is that true? There were. Yeah, with that development, the negotiation resulted in over a half a million dollars in community benefit agreements Mm. that went to the Malanga Cascalord Center to help upgrade some of the systems in that building towards the repainting of a mural was Mm -hmm. an eventual win and other uh, wins as well from that building. And Mm. The coalition that was formed within that struggle went on to fight for three other really big developments in the local neighborhood. All in all, they won, I think, over $20 million in community benefit agreements, Wow! uh, which was low-income housing, the chance to sit on a retail advisory board, having community representation, Mm. having storefronts be made more available to local community, a lot of wins. Uh, so it became yeah. in some ways a not a precedent and not a model because it's been done before, but kind of an inspirational force to continue that that right. fight with, with right. other developments as well. Well, and also it creates an expectation that if you're going to develop in Oakland, this is what you should be prepared to offer. I hope. I hope it creates this precedent in a way that people coming in will understand that as they try to develop in Oakland. I am curious because I saw your film through a film festival, the SF Urban Film Fest, and you talked then about creating an educational package to go with this film. Is that still in the works? And and what is the continued life of the film at this point? The curriculum's completed. It's being used in Oakland Unified School District currently and shown in a few high schools, middle schools. We just heard we're gonna be doing a screening with the Community College of San Francisco. Yeah, the film had a really wonderful kind of film festival tour. It showed in, I think, almost 30 film festivals. Wow. uh, Around the country and a bunch of international screenings. It's been translated into four other languages. Oh, wow. Um, It's played in South Korea and Germany. And I think what we've been most proud of is that we've actually developed a whole social impact campaign around the film, uh, supported by the California Arts Council and San Francisco Foundation. We did 14 screenings in communities impacted by gentrification throughout California and beyond. And those looked like, you know, in Fresno, we had a great screening in a plaza in downtown Fresno. Right. with a panel discussion outdoors, you know, because of the pandemic, a lot of our screenings of the film have been either virtual or outdoors, but it's been amazing. You know, I think we've, we just had our 50th screening of the film since it, wow. it's, and we have so many more planned, you know, we have mm-hmm. a, a nice run at the new parkway. It's continuing on four more screenings oh, okay. this week and it's going to Canada next, you know, early in the year. So it's just kind of keeps having this life create more screenings and opportunities in schools around the country and using the curriculum, you know, putting that into, into use along with these kind of impact screenings. Cause we're, we're seeing like gentrification is happening all over, right. especially with, I think the recent kind of mass migration that's occurred around COVID. Right. So many small communities, larger cities are just having these, population shifts and rents and housing prices are going through the roof. And so the story in this film seems to really connect, you know, Mm -hmm. with a lot of different communities that I wasn't expecting. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you're really right. Things that were already happening have really been exacerbated by this idea of moving out of a lot of expensive places like San Francisco and New York to places like Austin, San Antonio, other places that before were wonderful cities, but were more affordable cities. And yeah, well, I feel like I could talk with you for like three more hours about this film, but 
mostly I want people to look for it and to watch it. So how can people see this film and learn more about it, Spencer? Thank you. Right now, again, we're really working on um, expanding what was this statewide uh, social impact tour uh, mm -hmm. nationally. Got a, a grant to help support in 2022 to really expand that work. And so mm. we're doing outreach right now to find opportunities to screen the film and have discussion. So if folks are interested, they can definitely contact us, Alice Street Film at Gmail. And our website has all the upcoming screenings listed. We do have a, an educational distributor, which is videoproject.com, um, where you can find out how to bring the film to your school uh, and the curriculum as well. And yeah, again, there's just, I think there'll be continually uh, you know, upcoming screenings. We have a nice theatrical run happening here in Oakland. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, get in touch with us and we'd love to bring the film to you. Yeah, well, I hope people do. And I thank you so much for being on the podcast, but also thank you for making this film. I think for me, it was a very impactful watch and just blew me away. So thank you for making it. Well, thank you, Pam, for the opportunity to be on your podcast. It's really an honor. Thank you. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm so grateful to Spencer Wilkinson for being a guest on today's episode to talk about his documentary film, Alice Street. There's so much to celebrate about this film, including the ongoing social impact it's having from screenings in locations facing the same pressures of development and displacement. Alice Street tells the complex story around this mural. Its loss will always be sad. But contained in this story is also a blueprint for obtaining benefits for communities impacted by development. If you want to learn more about this film, visit alicestreet.com. You can get information to set up a screening in your community. The music you've heard in this podcast is Yellow Light District by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D major was performed by Karine Galanian. The music you heard in the intro is by Ketza. This podcast was edited by Eva Hristova. Thank you so much for listening to this episode today. What resonated with you? Did you have ideas about ways that your city or town could become more equitable and function better for more of its residents? How could you start this conversation? If you like this episode, please share it with a friend.